And the performance of the disconnect is really there. Javier has just this blank look in his eyes, and he never loses control. He ne What makes Anton amazing is he never gets upset. He never gets angry. The only times we really see any emotion on his face are when he's choking the deputy in that opening. And it's obviously he's his face is like crazy looking. It's the only time you see his face like that. But obviously he's doing a lot physically to keep that guy under his control. So that's he's obviously exerting a lot of force. But you also see elation and excitement in his eyes. And and then he has like an, or, an orgasmic ending conclusion when the guy dies and he just lets out this breath of relief and pleasure at the same time. Those are few instances where you actually see any kind of emotion in him. Hello, movie friends. Welcome back to the show. James and I are very excited to be here discussing one of the greatest characters made on film in the 21st century, Anton Chigurh from No Country for Old Men, played by the great Javier Bardem, who won an Oscar for this role. I, like you all know, love this movie. It's a, It was a magical mov movie year, 2007, to have both There Will Be Blood and No Country for Old Men come out at the, basically the same time. And this movie, I think, is perfect from the Coens. It's their best film in an amazing career. And it's partly in due to Javier Bardem's sinister, iconic, legendary performance as Anton Sugar. No Country for Old Men is based on the novel by Cormac McCarthy. We've done an episode breaking that down alongside There Will Be Blood, so definitely check that out if you it's haven't seen it. It's a good episode. In. did it a while ago, yeah. but it was such a fun one. And uh, Anton Sugar is the main antagonist in the book and the film, obviously, ironically, he doesn't have a single scene with the main character of both. The, well, the book, the main character is the sheriff, where in the movie it feels more like uh, Llewellyn Davis. And Carson Wells is also a big character yeah, big in the girl. novel as well. But Anton Chigurh has much more screen time in the film versus lines that he has in the novel. And I think that the Coen brothers understood that they have such an incredible presence for a character to work with that we got to get as much of this guy in this movie as possible. And Anton Chigurh, people rewatch No Country for Old Men not only because it's a masterpiece in filmmaking, one of the Coen's best, it's so well made and executed. But because of Anton Sugar, Anthony's laughing because I said breast. <laughs> because of Anton Sugar, people go back and revisit this movie over and over again just to watch the scenes that he's in because every single one of them is electric and engrossing. And it's like nothing you've never seen before, even though you've seen them a dozen times. You're like, what's this scene going to be like? And you get different you get different things out of his performance every time. Yeah, it's the performance and the writing and the directing and Roger Deakins cinematography that really make this movie excel. Because we've seen so many scenes of a person and a killer together and they're talking and we know someone's going to die. And we've seen that a thousand times, but somehow the Coens and Javier managed to make it feel like un so unnerving and suspenseful and thrilling and it's a testament to the filmmaking and the acting especially not just Javier Bardem but this movie has a lot of local actors that the Coen brothers like to use I mean that actor in the coin toss scene in the gas station scene he's amazing in that sequence he's really terrific and so and also the woman who works at the um what do you call the, the trailer park she's wonderful in that scene as well so the Coen brothers do a great job of directing like non-actors and local actors and to have them performing with and also the the guy on the road with the the clamps chicken coop. yeah the chicken coop guy they all did a wonderful job with their scenes they share with Javier Bardem and that's important because you ha you have an Oscar caliber highly experienced highly trained actor and he's acting with someone who's probably never been on a major movie set before. A lot can go wrong, especially with the other side. You, I'll, you can watch movies where a great actor is working with a, an okay actor or a very inexperienced actor, and it's noticeable. It's very noticeable who's a great actor and who's kind of doesn't shouldn't really be in that scene. And they it stands out. But the Coen brothers do a wonderful job, and those local actors did a sensational job in their scenes opposite Javier. 
And that is also a very important reason why the scenes work, because Javier's great, but they're great too. Just, you mind if I correct you? So Gene Jones plays the gas station attendant. He's yeah. actually a, a experienced veteran actor. Okay, thank so you. So yeah. I think that's why he's sensational in that role. Mm -hmm. The other characters, the trailer park attendant, and the, the chicken coop guy on the road, those are definitely local actors gotcha. for sure. But Gene Jones is an experienced guy. You've probably seen him in a bunch he's of stuff. He's wonderful in that scene. Yeah, I mean, he's in the Sacrament, the Thai West movie. Oh, yes, yes, he's, yes. He's, he's, sorry, just to correct you real quick. Oh, thanks. Now, Cormac McCarthy's description of Anton Chigurh in the book is blue eyes, serene, dark hair, something about him faintly exotic beyond Moss's, Noelle Moss's experience. The creation of the character is basically the unstoppable evil, which is a common archetype in Cormac McCarthy's work. The Corn Brothers wanted to, to avoid a one-dimensional one dimensionality, particularly a comparison to the Terminator, which he has a lot of similarities to in this with this character in this movie, which we'll get to later on. In the Coen Brothers, director co-director Joel Cohen has stated that they wanted someone who looks like they could have come from Mars, which is actually a great description because when you watch the movie, he seems like an alien. He seems like he's not human, just a machine and some kind of being that has no reason for being on this earth besides killing people. He has such a disconnect from reality and from other people. And that's one of the most obvious things about Anton is the way he talks to people and the way he talks about people, he has no connection to anyone. And he has no empathy, no emotion. At times, he'll even toy with his prey and taunt them. People always say the same thing, and he laughs at that. He has absolutely no feelings at all. He he, and he's he's actually he's become like kind of you could say impatient and annoyed at how people always act the same way right before they die. You don't have to do this. Yeah, people they always, always say, say the same thing. Yeah, what do they say? You don't have to do this. And it, yeah, that's what makes him such a terrifying villain because like he could like you could ask his boss could be like you need to kill this baby. He would kill the baby without hesitation. And so I just think that in terms of villains, in terms of killers, he's definitely up there for the greatest of all time. And the performance of the disconnect is really there. Javier has just this blank look in his eyes, and he never loses control. He ne What makes Anton amazing is he never gets upset. He never gets angry. The only times you really see any emotion on his face are when he's choking the deputy in that opening. And it's obviously he's his face is like crazy looking. It's the only time you see his face like that, but obviously he's doing a lot physically to keep that guy under his control. So that's, he's obviously exerting a lot of force, but you, you also see elation and excitement in his eyes. And and then he has like an, or, an orgasmic ending conclusion when the guy dies and he just lets out this breath of relief and pleasure at the same time. Those are few instances where you actually see any kind of emotion in him. It's He only gets really excited when he kills. And I think that's obviously a main motivation for what he does just to be able to kill people is what he wants, but I I love how he never loses his cool, cool, and he has complete control over his emotions. He never screams, shouts, or raises his voice. Not once. Not even when he's in extremely severe pain from either the car accident, breaking his arm, or getting the shrapnel or the 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 shotgun pellets in his leg after the sequence with Luella Moss the shootout. In uh, Del Rio, he never screams, like you said, never gets angry, never shouts, he never raises his voice, which is so rare for a character to do. I don't think I've ever seen a villain who doesn't scream or raise their voice. Hannibal Lecter basically does a little bit here and there, but he he's mostly very controlled his emotions as well. But if he, he does lose, if he does get loud, it's 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 a part of his game. It's just, yeah, yeah. to get attention on him for something specific, but. Anton Chigurh never once raises his voice in this entire film, which is wild. Now, the name, his background and nationality are left undisclosed and largely open to speculation. When writer Cormac McCarthy visited the set, the actors inquired about Chigurh's background and the symbolic significance between behind the name. McCarthy simply replied, I thought it was just a cool name, Anton Chigurh. Some have claimed that the surname Chigurh originates from an unspecified Nigerian language and translates to the one who brings food. The haircut itself, the Coen brothers got the idea for Chigurh's hairstyle from a book Tommy Lee Jones had. It featured a 1979 photo of a man sitting in the bar of a brothel with a very similar hairstyle and clothes similar to those worn by Chigurh in the film. Oscar-winning hairstylist Paul LeBlanc designed the hairdo. The Coens instructed LeBlanc to create a strange and unsettling hairstyle. LeBlanc based the style 
on the mop tops of the English warriors and the Crusades, as well as the photo from that book. Bardem told the blank each morning when he finished that the style helped him to get into character intensely. However, Bardem supposed that but supposedly said he's not going to get laid for two months because of the haircut. The haircut is iconic, and it's part of the character because Anton, he seems to be, because like we said, he has absolutely no connection to humanity or people. He seems to be someone who's like blending in like an alien trying to blend in amongst people and so i think that's why he has a haircut that he's like trying to see what does this haircut make me look normal so that i can blend in because he understands behavior and he understands that if he presents himself a certain way people will do well people will act in the way he wants them to an example is when he kills that man on the side of the road after he escapes the deputy and he so he has the he has the police cruiser so that's why he pulls the guy over and the guy it's if a person sees this for the first time, they might be like, why did that guy just let Anton put the the air gun right to his forehead without doing anything? This is like an example of human behavior. The guy thinks he's standing with an authority figure, someone who has a lot of power over him, fear of offending. He doesn't he might be afraid to question what this supposed police officer is doing. And also some people can be just passive and let things happen to them. I think this is a great example of the Coen brothers understanding behavior. I think a lot of people would have been like, oh, if a guy brought that to my forehead, I'd be like, get it out of my face. He's not even dressed as a cop. Yeah, not even a cop. But in in the moment, a lot of people don't act the way that they think they might want to act. Like if you might imagine, oh, if I'm in the dangerous situation, I'll act well. But oftentimes a lot of people might freeze from fear or uncertainty. And also combine that with the fear of offending, not wanting to talk back to an authority figure. This is an example of how Anton understands that if he's polite, and just speaks calmly to this man he assumes he's a cop he'll do exactly what i want just stand still and i'll be able to kill him without any concern or any problem so he really understands human behavior and he manipulates that he has an excellent introduction to this film too the opening of the film is the voice over from sheriff bell but it also is we're being shown Anton Chigurh, he's the opening character of the film and we don't really see his face until you know he's being arrested on the side of a road He's being put into the cruiser. Then we see a decent shot of his face, but we see his his captive bolt stunner before we even see his face. We see his weapon, this air tank. What is this thing? And then he murders the cop inside the police station at the precinct. After, as soon as he hangs up the phone. Clever- I love how it's right when he hangs up. I got everything under control. It's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Cleverly sliding his handcuffs underneath his body because you can tell he's probably done this a dozen times he's figured out how to escape handcuffs probably has practiced it so many hours by himself how to get free of handcuffs or to maneuver them around his body and underneath his his butt to get them his hands free in front of him kills the cop immediately obviously it's a great iconic sequence it seems really realistic the skid marks on the ground from the shoes and everything it's, it's really tremendous And he's very calm the entire time afterwards, you know, cleaning his hands because it seems like everything he's done, he's done a hundred times, whether it's killing people or the medicinal therapy that he's able to do for himself or the killings, the the, the crimes he's committing. He's done it all a hundred times. And what's interesting about the deputy scene is obviously the deputy has his back turned to Anton. And the reason for this is because if you're a normal person and you're arrested, even if you're a criminal, you're not going to try to kill a deputy. <laughs> That'd be insane. It's Especially like, when you're handcuffed behind yeah, your back. Yeah, but even if like someone could get out of handcuffs, even if they, a, a person or a criminal had the handcuffs in front of him, he's not gonna, that person's not going to try to kill a deputy. But Anton's different from anyone else. He's like a ghost. And he knows that he can, he knows how to evade police and how to just seamlessly disappear. So he's that's why the deputy has his back turned to him vulnerably because he's not expecting this guy to choke him out right there. Well, I think it's more not that like a guy's someone's not going to kill you with handcuffs on. Yeah. I think someone there's a pretty good chance that could happen because he's so polite and calm during the yeah. arrest. The cop sees him as not a threat. I think that's why he has his back to him and he feels safe. Yeah, both those things I would say. But in getting back to the beginning, I'm, bra- I'm glad you brought it up. The voiceover. The voiceover by Ed Tom in the opening, he's describing this young boy he encountered and was arrested. This boy was arrested for murder, put on the electric chair, and they questioned the kid, the young guy, and about why he killed this person. And the young guy said, I just wanted to. I've always wanted to kill someone. And if if you let me out again, I'd do it again. And then Ed Tom describes the the young guy going on the electric chair and saying, "Uh, I'll see you in hell. Be there in about 15 minutes. This isn't describing Anton Sugar. 
not, obviously he's not the kid, but it's an example of what Anton Sugar is. This killing machine, basically. This person who has no regard for human life, who just kills, doesn't think twice about it, and is pure evil. One of the main themes is pure evil, and obviously No Country for Old Men. This all relates to the idea is, is the world becoming more evil, has, or has the world always been evil? I think ultimately the, the main theme of the film is that the world has always had evil people in it, evil men in it. And it's not that things are changing, it's that a character like Ed Tom doesn't have the strength to fight it anymore. I think he's not, he doesn't, he's, think, Ed Tom thinks that the world's getting worse, the world's getting darker. I don't understand these people who kill. I don't understand the people who, like that couple who have the dead, the buried, the graves in their backyard. And But what Ed Tom isn't really understanding is that the world's always been evil. He just can't handle it anymore. And he's not, he's not equipped to deal with it anymore. And Anton Sugar is a perfect example of that kid that Ed Tom describes in the opening narration. It's the understanding mostly for Ed Tom. Yeah. You know, it's the, the theme of no country for old men. He doesn't understand the world anymore. He doesn't understand how people are doing the things they're doing. You know, the, the this reports beside, you know, the, the graves in the backyard with the couple and then the other vicious killings that they talk about from newspaper clippings and stuff like that. So Ed Tom doesn't understand the world. That's why he doesn't understand really Anton Chigurh. No one understands Anton Chigurh. Even Carson Wells thinks he understands Anton Chigurh, but he really doesn't know, understand Anton Chigurh. His employers don't understand him. Llewellyn Moss thinks he understands him to an extent, but Llewellyn Moss is clearly unmatched in this scenario. He is not cut out for this lifestyle of going against these gangsters, these criminals, these killers. Now, Anton Chigurh is highly intelligent. He's an expert at a lot of things. He's an expert at being invisible. You know, a lot of things he does, like car swapping, getting rid of any traces of evidence at all. That's the entire point of that gas station scene with the attendant. He wasn't going to walk in there and just kill the guy. The reason why he's going to use his fatalistic or supposed fatalistic approach of killing him with the coin toss is because the gas station attendant thought he was making small talk by asking about the weather up in Dallas, whereas Anton Chigurh sees this as, oh, he's noticed my plates. He sees that I'm coming from Dallas, which could mean more inf information or evidence being presented to an investigator in the future of that someone from Dallas was here with a stolen car from Dallas, came down this way. So he's trying to always eliminate all methods of evidence. That's why he's killing the gas station tenant or almost kills the gas station tenant. It's not because he wants to, it's because he has to. I got, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I, while I was doing some research on the, on the character, I saw a bunch of stuff online, some, some U YouTube video essays saying that one person said they didn't understand why he killed the gas station attendant. Maybe he wanted to. But he didn't kill him. He was going to. Oh, he was going to. And then another person said that uh, he killed the gas station attendant because he was upset that um, he married into it. And I was like, I mean, they, these, they didn't really understand the scene. The, the reason why he ever even does the coin toss sequence with the gas station attendant is, like you said, because he noticed that he was from Dallas. This is a loose end that he wants that Anton believes he should close up. But he's leaving it up to his fatalistic coin toss to make the decision for him. So any, th this is an example of Anton's not just a mindless killing machine. He doesn't just kill everyone he sees. He underst he. So I think Anton he loves killing. He enjoys it. It's the it's like the hunt. He's like serial killers. Um, you're a little you know a little bit more than me, but they get. They get aroused from killing, right? It's usually, it's usually sexual. Because that's what – it looks like that's what is happening in the deputy choking scene. He's getting sexually aroused by killing the man, and then he has like that orgasmic release once he's done. So I think Anton is an example of that trait of a serial killer, of someone who gets aroused and sexually turned on from killing. But he understands because he's so smart. He can't just kill people whenever he wants. And also I think this is why he loves this job, enjoys doing it because – he gets to combine work and play. Yeah. <laughs> it's his passion. <laughs> and he gets to do it. Uh, I don't. He's not interested in money. He's not interested in power. It seems like he's just interested in killing. Oh, he's definitely interested in money. That's one of his main motivations in, in his uh, life. Well, we can, we can discuss that. Yeah. I, 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 I have a debate about that. I, I, I kind of disagree. Stay on the gas station. Yeah, though. yeah. But, but my point is that, um, oh, what was I saying? I'm sorry. Sorry. He doesn't care about money. He doesn't care about killing. So, so he does, he kills for reasons. He only kills someone because of a certain reason. This gas station attendant is an example. Everyone he kills is not for, for nothing. They either got in his way, caused the problem, which is why he kills those two other criminals in the desert because they, they, they were in charge of the drug deal and they let it go Ari, so they deserve to die for making this all happen. He kills the Mexicans because they're also going after the money. It should just be him. He kills the accountant 
because the accountant hired other people to pursue. No, the accountant, we don't know if he got killed or not. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the, employer. Um, the employer, not the accountant. The employer, he kills. I, I'm sorry. I got mm -hmm. the name, so the job to, mixed I'm up. I'm here to fix you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so from the guy from Office Space. <laughs> Milton. Milton. <laughs> Have you seen my stapler? So he, and, and then he kills Carla. Well, I say he kills Carla Jean because of the, the deal he made, the deal that he offered to Llewellyn and Llewellyn passed on the offer so he like owed it to well and as he says he he made he gave his word to him to kill her and so he kills people for reasons it's, there's it's not just mindless killing and that's where i think he understands that he's a tool and then he carries out the the killings that he wants to carry out as the tool yeah he's got rules that he abides by they're messed up rules for sure and those are like killing anyone who inconveniences him disrespects him wrongs him has evidence against him from a crime. Like you said, he kills Carla Jean because he's basically keeping his word to himself, to Llewellyn, that he'd kill his wife. And so... That don't make no sense. <laughs> it, it relates to Carson Wells, played by Woody Harrelson, the conversation he has with Llewellyn, where he's talking about him in the hospital. Like, you, you've you seen him and you're not dead. Um, you could say that this person, Anton Chigurh, has a set of principles, principles that transcend... People transcend drugs, killing, murder, it transcends everything. It's his own sense of fatalism, his own sense of principles. And he'll kill anyone just for inconveniencing him. Even if you brought him the money to his feet, if you made a deal with him, he'd still just kill you. And that's why it's interesting. And back to the gas station for just another moment. I, I would love to talk about the gas station for a, a little you, bit. When you rewatch that scene again, like Anthony said, how a lot of people misunderstand and they think that he's killing the gas station attendant for pleasure or like you said for him finding out that the gas station attendant married into the property what happens is as soon as the gas station attendant brings up dallas anton sugar completely changes his tone he's being polite and cordial to an extent before that he's just paying for his gas getting out of there once his can is up peanuts and he's gonna leave and i love the shot where the the peanuts are uncrinkled i love wrapping it paper. i love it it's the tension yeah it just shows like yeah. how slow this moment is in both of their lives especially the gas station attendant as soon as he brings up dallas that's when Anton Chigurh realizes I'm gonna have to either kill this guy or not. I'm gonna have my coin toss fate to decide his decide his fate. And the rest of the questioning by Anton Chigurh, it's not because he's like getting pleasure out of it. I don't think. I think he's just probing the gas station attendant for weaknesses to attack him somehow to get some more power on top of him to learn more about him. He's also figuring out if I kill this man, when do I do it and how do I do it? Exactly. That's why. What time do you go to bed? What time do you close? I don't want any witnesses. Where do you live? You live out back. He's also getting the information he needs to kill this man. And he's offended by the man saying he married into the property because you can say that Anton Chigurh has a very traditional view of the world and hierarchy of men versus women. You can assume where it's tradition and in, in maybe in his mind for men to own property and to own the situations that the family make money off of. So I, I saw an interview with Javier Bardem and he said that an example of that he said that the way he approached the character, and he this is his interpretation for acting. It's He doesn't know what Cormac McCarthy's intentions were writing it, but the way Javier in, in approached that scene is that once the gas station attendant said that he married into it, that kind of like it offended Anton because he felt that a person should own their should earn their place and should earn the things they have because there's more honor in that. And so that's, that's why Javier approached it as being kind of like, offended by the fact that this man married into a business rather than earning it himself, which is really fascinating. Gotcha. He also approached the the entire idea of Anton, the coin toss, and these uh, decisions of whether to kill a person or not and leaving it up to the coin toss. Javier approached the acting in terms of, he said that while he was in the scenes, he kept thinking in his head, there's a higher power that I'm uh, a tool for, and the higher power is making the choice of whether Anton kills this person or not, and that's how he performed the scenes. And that not, that might not necessarily be what McCormick McCarthy had in mind, but that's how Javier got in his head how he acted as his character, which is really fascinating. I love the the idea that you're you're wondering what such a brilliant actor is doing in their head during a sequence like that, during a scene like that, and I like the idea of this higher power having a say. And basically, Anton is like a scalpel for this higher power because the whole coin toss in the gas station is an example of both fate and chance, which are two heavy themes in this film. Chance being 
both the coin, whether it heads, whether it lands heads or tails, and also chance of these two p- people interacting in this one moment in time, which also ties to fate because Anton multiple times this talks about the quarters as in uh, with Carla Jean. He's like, I got here the same way the coin did. Uh, and also in the gas station, he points out the date of the coin. It's been traveling 20 years to get to this moment. And also both he and the gas station attendant have been traveling all their lives to get to this one moment. All of the, the decisions they made, every interaction they had throughout their entire lives led to this five minute window in the middle of nowhere in a gas station in Texas. And that's the fatalism aspect of Anton Sugar that he believes. And also, there's that question where the man's asking, I don't know what I'm putting up. And Javier, Anton says, you've, you've been putting up your whole life. The way That's an interesting line because the way I look at that, putting it up your whole life, what's he, the man doesn't really know what he's putting up, but Anton knows you're putting your life up for this coin toss. And he's also saying you've been putting it up your whole life because everyone's at risk of dying of losing their life like any day and something could happen you could get in a car accident a fire anything like er- er- your life is in jeopardy in some some minor way every every day of your life and every decision you make could put your life at, at risk you know what i mean and so i think that ha- anton understands how every day so- you could die and that's what he's been putting up his entire life he just didn't realize that his life has always been in jeopardy and always been at risk of dying and right now, this is a moment where it is going to happen or it's not going to happen. Yeah, every moment of your life has led to where you are in this moment right now. Everyone listening, every moment of your life pretty much has led to where you are right now. All your decisions in the past and in this deep, today. Deep. It's very deep. We've talked about that a lot of times. And that's clearly Anton Sugar believes in fate. However, he uses his belief in fate as an excuse to kill people. You know, he... He sees himself as a tool for fate and he uses coin toss to justify murder. By using the coin toss, it relieves him of any remorse because he's probably the most remorseless character for a villain you've ever seen on film before. I mean, he shows no empathy or sympathy or even Hannibal emotions. doesn't want to kill uh, Sterling. Exactly. Sterling. He's, he's like, I don't want your the world's better with you in it. So Anton Chigurh completely remorseless and his coin toss relieves him of any potential guilt he could ever feel not that he has feelings but if he maybe did maybe he did in his past and he's used the coin toss to eliminate feelings from his decisions and he thinks that this coin toss is a fair tool to use on whether or not i kill somebody even though it's completely unfair because like carla jean says the coin's got no say in it it's up to you you have the say and anton sugar still believes in his principles that he is a weapon of fate and he's kind of blinded himself into believing this that he only he uses the coin toss like i said to uh, let himself not feel any emotion at all at killing people and also it could be that he he believes that the decision of the coin, the decision of chance is fate. And it was always meant to be for this person to either die or this person to live. And so I think that's the reason why he also why he does the coin toss where it's not it's it's not only that he wants to relieve himself from the choice, it's like he doesn't believe that he should choose. He believes that it's fate that should choose to kill this person or not, and not me. Even though like him killing that bird is an example of him choosing to kill something. He actually misses it. Yeah, and it tried to kill something. And the way he might look at missing the bird and not killing it, even though he tried, is that that bird never was supposed to die in that moment. It wasn't its fate. And so I think that he believes so deeply in fate that everything that happens, he believes was supposed to happen exactly as it did. And that's why he lets the coin decide. It's not like literally, I'm just going to, it could be anything, any kind of chance, but that's the 50-50 chance. It works so well for yes or no. It's just the idea that letting fate choose, and I not even, I shouldn't even be allowed to choose to kill these people. I'm just carrying out fate's, fate's desire. Let's get into some more characteristics of Anton Chigurh. He's, like I said, highly intelligent. He's a brilliant strategist. He shows this multiple times throughout the film. One of my favorite examples of this is when he gets to the first motel that Llewellyn purchases two hotel rooms for. He's looking at the map. Very smart by Llewellyn. The Mexican uh, hired uh, members are also there as well looking for the case of money. Anton Chigurh shows up as well 
not realizing that there is there as well. He's just tracking the money. Hmm. And Anton Chigurh gets a hotel room looking at the map as well. And what he cleverly does is before he barges into the room that he's going to find the money in, he thinks, he practices on his own room that is identical to the room that he's about to barge in. So he practices kicking the door open real quick or opening it real fast, turning the lights on and seeing all the spots that someone could be sitting down or laying down on a bed. Someone could be hiding behind a piece of furniture or a shelf, what the bathroom looks like, all potential areas for a target to be so that he knows when he goes into that room, he knows the exact layout of the situation. He also does things like takes his shoes off whenever he's going up to a hotel room or about to attack somebody to prevent anyone from hearing his footsteps. He does this at that motel sequence as well. And then also at the Del Rio motel, the second one, the hotel that Llewellyn's hiding for the second time where he shuts, he takes his shoes off. When he gets to the door, he hears the cock of the gun inside by Llewellyn, shuts the lights off as well in the hallway, shoes off. So Llewellyn cannot hear him at all. Two, those are a couple of great examples of his strat- strategies. Yeah. I, Strateg- I, I, strategism. Strategies. So, strategies. Strategery. Strate- it's about strategery. <laughs> <laughs> Will Ferrell is George Bush. <laughs> I've always, even as a kid, I always was like, why doesn't anyone ever take their shoes off to be silent in, in socks when they're approaching someone? And then when I saw this, I was like, finally! It makes sense. It makes total Like, if I if I had to kill someone. <laughs> Sounds like you've done it. <laughs> and I had to sneak up on someone, I would take my shoes off. It just seems like the great, the, the, the perfect way to sneak up on someone. And... He's so adept at killing. I wonder if he had some kind of military background or anything because he's so so efficient the way he takes out those three men in the hotel room. It's really incredible. He understands how to be silent with that giant silencer on the shotgun because shotguns are so loud, but he's got this huge silencer on it, and it makes it nearly nearly silent, especially if you're, you're pretty far away. That sequence, the hotel sequence, is so well choreographed, so well photographed by Deacon's perfectly blocked and i love the approach that it's not bloody it's not gory but you it seems so realistic and it's not like super fast cuts it's not a bunch of setups it's really only a handful of of shots in that entire scene even though it's action heavy it's not quick cutting and you're always with anton's perspective i think that's also one of the strengths of the filmmaking is you're in his perspective they're not doing shots of the men inside the hotel room when it happens you're not you're never like behind them with the camera you're always with anton in every moment and that gives just the audience a connection to him that it's like it feels like it's a lot of it's his movie in a lot of ways as well as ed tom and Llewellyn. he's not just like a bad guy you're like following his story as well which i think the audience really connects to that thread of the entire plot this movie is hyper violent. I mean, the opening scene is him strangling somebody to death with handcuffs and his blood. But I think what the Coen brothers do a great job of doing is not over stylizing the, the blood and the violence. It's just kind of quick. It's just, like you said, just quick perspective of Anton Chigurh through all these elements of killing. Just more of the gore we see that is the healing sequences is it, really. And Javier Bardem was excited at the prospect of working with the Coen brothers. However, he was hesitant because he didn't feel super comfortable playing such a violent prone character as Anton Chigurh. So it's something that he had to deal with, and I think the perspective of the Coen brothers of how they were going to film everything made him more confident in taking on the role. Yeah, I mean, you don't need a bunch of shots. Like, the shot of him killing the guy with the Uzi, it's just, it's the camera stays behind Anton, and he kills him, and then the guy dies and shoots up the gun. It's just two shots that they cut together, and that's all you need. It's the mature approach to the filmmaking, and I love the the self-care scene, the <laughs> self-care <laughs> It, <laughs> I wouldn't exactly call yeah. that self-care. It, it shows another example. <laughs> Treat yourself. <laughs> he has such a high tolerance for pain, which is fascinating. This looks like the most painful ordeal a person could experience, and he's able to do it without any, with barely even showing a hint of pain. He winces a little bit. I love when he gets into the bathtub, uh, and he's just like, that's his first moment of relief. But like, the I think the most disturbing part of that scene is when he's trying to get his jeans off. So he's kicking his boot off. And then you you already know how tolerant he is to pain, but to see him and he's like, he, this is him showing pain. And, and and Javier is amazing. He just like looks around the ceiling, like kind of annoyed, like oh man, this hurts. But he's not really wincing, or it's just his eyes are showing the pain and looking away from the moment. And you can tell that really hurts right there. Even though he's not showing much, you can tell that is probably the most painful part of that entire sequence. And then him trying to pull the jeans out of his injured leg, it's amazing. And it seems like. 
this is a moment like he's clearly gotten hit before. He's clearly had pretty bad wounds before, which is why he so expertly takes care of his wounds. He knows exactly what he needs in terms of antibiotics. He's just an, an expert surgeon in a lot of ways. And the way he's able to craft like this basically surgery room inside of a motel is really fascinating. And his quick recovery, and he's already out at it again the next day, shows why he's such an unstoppable force. Yes, he's human. Yes, he's flesh and bone. But he's so adept at taking care of himself that even if you hit him really well with some buckshot, like he's going to get up the next day and he's going to come after you again. Yeah, he's got a broad knowledge of medicine and Either maybe he worked in a hospital. I don't know. It's, that's what's so fascinating about the character. He clearly has so many skills. Of a, sort of a military background, medical background, something, a little bit of everything. Like I said, he's been in every situation probably a hundred times before. And I think for me, when I watch this scene, I think the bathtub when he's cleaning the wound, that looks like the most pain for him because that's when he actually like lets out a gas. He's like, <sighs> he's like, oh my God, that hurts so bad. Um, and he skillfully treats his wounds, like they said, almost surgically. He knows immediately how to make that sling for his broken arm at the end of the film. That maybe might be the most helpless he's been in the, in the film. Most vulnerable. Most vulnerable is the car crash. We'll get into that in a little bit. But just comparing him to Llewellyn Moss in these sequences where Llewellyn also needs medical attention. What Llewellyn does is he goes to Mexico and he needs the help of strangers to get him to a hospital in order to, be, to recover and to help himself. Whereas Anton Chigurh he does everything himself. He creates that distraction with the car bomb steals everything he needs from the pharmacy and treats himself. And so I want to go over what he does for his treatment. Yeah, although Llewellyn had, Llewellyn had a much worse wound. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, he he shot, shot through his stomach. His stomach yeah. yeah. Um, on screen, he we can steal, see him steal as many syringes and also most likely the falling objects. Besides that, he steals injectable lidocaine, sterile water, providone iodine, syringes, an injectable antibiotic and bandages. First, he takes the bath to clean his wound. Then he mixes some providone povidone iodine which is that orange brown antiseptic with the sterile water and pours this on the wound to avoid infection afterwards he puts lidocaine in the syringe and injects it around the wound lidocaine is a local anesthetic to avoid the pain during the next step of using sterilized tweezers in boiling water to remove the pellets from the leg he then puts a bandage on and finally injects himself with which, with what with what is most likely an antibiotic to avoid general infection and maybe even possibly morphine who knows yeah i i love that sequence and then it's it's just fascinating like so few people have probably even seen like carson says seen him and live to tell the day to the tale that he survived Anton's attack, which shows how great of a you know hunter, fighter, capable person that Llewellyn is. And but even so, Llewellyn thinks that he's a match for him, but no one's a match for Anton. He's the perfect tool. It was the it was the it was Llewellyn's one chance at Anton, and Anton escaped pretty easily. And I like how they never see each other again. That's their final scene together is when. Their final moment together is when Llewellyn fires the shotgun at him. That's the only time they see each other. It's really for the their rest only of the moment film. together is that sequence. Yeah, and that sequence it's one of the I think most thrilling, suspenseful sequence ever put sequences ever put on film. From at Llewellyn discovering the tracker in the money to the, the, the trying to call the attendant downstairs, hearing the ring over and over and over again, and then the power going out, and then. The interaction of him, of Anton taking off the doorknob, Ed, uh, Llewellyn firing, then escaping, barely getting out the window as the bullet hits the window glass. And then he th he makes a pretty wise decision of not just running off, but going underneath through the front bottom floor of the hotel to escape out the back because because he's pretty much a, a duck. Um, Sitting duck. A sitting duck, just if he just escapes out that way because Anton's right at that window. And then he escapes through the alley. Anton gets the perfect one shot, hits him right in the gut, bullet through him. And then the sequence where Llewellyn stops the guy in the truck and he's like, I need to ride out of here. Boom, boom, throat shot, head shot. And then the sound design of that sequence of Llewellyn driving the truck and then you hear bullets cramming into the, the metal of the truck and the glass over and over and over and over again. It's so incredible. And then the final showdown where Llewellyn makes the wise decision of rather than escaping, I'm going to hide and get a moment, a, 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 a powerful uh, situation where I can take advantage of Anton approaching me and then Anton escaping because he's so adept 
at evading. It's an amazing sequence. No music, all sound design and great cinematography. So well choreographed. But again, an example of how Anton really is like a ghost in a lot of ways. I love the sound design of the weapons in this film, specifically the silent shotgun, which there are such thing as silences for shotguns, but I believe the shotgun that was used in this film, the Remington 1187 semi-automatic shotgun, cannot be used with the silence in the film, but I'm sure it just looks really cool yeah, on camera. Yeah, only only experts will really notice that. Also, the silence Tech-9 is what he's shooting at Llewellyn in that sequence with more accuracy, and that's a basically a large handgun, and to have that kind of accuracy from a distance where he's hitting headshot for the guy in the car shows the expert marksmanship that Anton Sugar has. He's obviously a surgeon with the shotgun, just like the character in Kill Bill when uh, Uma finds out, <laughs> when Beatrix finds out she's pregnant at the hotel. I'm a fucking surgeon with a shotgun. Well, I'm not, Annie Oakley, and not, I got you in my sights. Not that I have to be, but I'm a fucking surgeon with a shotgun. <laughs> Anton also uses the captive bolt stunner, which he uses to kill his victims in the head as well as a tool he uses to shoot door locks now the film explains what this is by sheriff bell accidentally bringing it up in a story he's telling carla jean about the rancher who kills bulls who used to kill bulls with a gun but there was a ricochet one time shot him in the shoulder and you go see him to this day he still can't lift his arm for his hat and so that's why he uses a captive bolt stunner now I ironically or coincidentally that is the main weapon of choice by anton Chigurh. It's a it's a brilliant weapon because it doesn't leave trace. It's not you, there's no bullet left in someone's head for uh, police to find and then track down. It, it, he's such a ghost and adept at evading uh, anyone finding him. That tool it's it's why it's, it's his preferred tool. I think there's no way you can ever trace it back to someone because it look to the cops and deputies. It looks like it, they they assume like someone shot him in the head and then took the bullet out. That's how clean of a getaway you can provide yourself if you use that weapon so it's a and also just the the iconic imagery of anton sugar holding that tank is just amazing it's one of my favorite images in film and it kind of makes him seem non-threatening as well i think that's one of the main reasons why the police officer in the opening of the film feels safe with anton sugar to his back not only because anton sugar we can only assume was very polite and obey every instruction that the police officer gave him during the arrest, but also the police officer believes it's some sort of oxygen tank. Maybe he thinks that Anton Sugar, the character or the guy right, is yeah. sick. You know, he's, he's a sick guy with an oxygen tank. He's not going to try to kill me or anything like that. He's probably very weak and feeble. So I think that's another way to make him seem sort of non-threatening to police officers. We can assume because I think that's what happens. That's a great point. I, I like that. How about we'll go into our intermission right now and then we'll get back to Anton Sugar because there's still so much to talk about with this fascinating villain. Let's do it. Before we continue, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost podcast besides telling your friends and movie buds about us using our coupon codes is you can also become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost podcast. You get awesome perks like weekly bonus episodes that every patron has access to, messages and video messages from us, as well as $10 Twenty five dollar and one hundred dollar tier patrons have access to our Discord. It's an amazing community of film lovers, fans of the show. We do watch parties on there as well. Twenty five dollar and one hundred dollar tier patrons get their own custom episode. You pick the topic, we do it for you. One hundred dollar tier patrons also get their own watch party, as well as being an executive producer on the main episodes of the show. You hear your voice at the end, and you get to come on the show as a guest segment. Every after three months of this episode is also sponsored by our great friends at MoviePosters.com. Use our special promo code Raiders10 to get 10% off your order today. They have a gigantic selection of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their poster library, as well as all sorts of options for backlighting and framing. So whatever your poster needs are. MoviePosters.com has you covered. We have a bunch of these great posters on our set and in our home. High quality, super affordable. It's the best you can pay for. Again, head on over to MoviePosters.com and use our promo code Raiders10 to get 10% off your order today. Now let's head into our intermission and begin with the movie quote competition. You ready? Yes. Now, Anthony, let me finish the entire quote, okay? (laughs) This kid is always interrupting me while I'm saying the quote. Give everyone else a chance. (laughs) Listen up, ladies and gentlemen. Our fugitive has been on the run for 90 minutes. 
Average foot speed over uneven ground bearing injuries is four miles per hour. That gives us a radius of six miles. What I want from each and every one of you is a hard target search of every gas station, residence, warehouse, farmhouse, hen house, outhouse, and dog house in that area. Checkpoints go up at 15 miles. Your fugitive's name is Dr. Richard Kimball. Go get him. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> Tommy Lee Jones and the fugitive. <laughs> that was a good impression. Thanks. That was a good impression. <laughs> I didn't kill my wife. <laughs> uh, find a man. I was attacked with a man with a mechanical arm. Find him. <laughs> <laughs> a mechanical arm. <laughs> All right, here's my quote. This is a, it's not a quote, it's a title card. The following is a work of fiction. Any resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Especially you, Jenny Beckman, bitch. <laughs> this is the opening to 500 days of summer yeah I, I believe that is the screenwriter's ex that like broke his heart yeah that he wrote the, sto the story the story based, based on, on yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny <laughs> I, I remember seeing it in theaters and everyone was cracking up yeah it was, it was, really a, it was a, a it's a good joke that was a great theater movie yeah you know that was a really fun movie to see yeah. in the theaters i had but a great time that set funny. the tone is great it really did that's a really great movie we should cover it sometime guess this movie release year Beautiful. 2008. 2010. Uh, guess this movie release year. 10 Things I Hate About You. It's a pretty old one. Let's see. It's got to be 2000s. JGL's kid. I'm going to go 2000 and... Little JGL. Little JGL, but... Because uh, Brokeback was 2005, I think. Or 2000, 2005. No, Broke, 2005. 2005, yeah. yeah. So I'd say 2001. 1999. 1999. Oh my yeah. gosh. They're all super young in it. I love how whenever I'm going through my answer, like figuring out my answer, it sounds like Michael Scott sometimes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I don't even know what I'm going to say. It's just an improvised conversation. <laughs> I'll tell you, David, you should never do anything anytime to, to anyone. To anybody. For, for, ever, any for any reason, for any ever. reason. <laughs> ever. David, David's face is like, <laughs> he's like losing the light, life in his face. <laughs> All right. Movie pop quiz time. When Javier Bardem was a young actor, he appeared on a daytime Spanish TV show called El Dia por Delante. His role was of a superhero. What superhero did he play? He played a superhero? Was it a famous superhero? Superhero, yeah. Is, is it someone like uh, that I would know? Yeah, it's superhero. <laughs> right, I'm saying it could it's be like a made up. It's not like Tentacle Man or something. Well, I'm just that's what I'm asking. Is it someone? It's a soap opera. No, it's a daytime TV. It's a daytime TV, daytime TV show, not okay. soap opera. All right. <laughs> he played. He played. I'm gonna go with. Um, who would he be good? I would go. Shoot, I don't know. Um, and what year was it? I think it was 1989 or it was 1990. In the 80s? 1990. Superman. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> he's the only. He was the only like big superhero back then. His character was also driven onto set on a motorcycle with a Spanish Indiana Jones and someone in ET costume. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> so it's like a day. It's like a live daytime TV show. God. Oh, in gotcha. Spain. Oh, that's, that sounds cool. He had like the the hair and everything, like uh -huh. the curl up front. Yeah, he he looks like a, he's a a great Perfect Spanish, a great Spanish Superman. Superman yeah. yeah. Good question. <laughs> All right. In what movie did Joseph Gordon-Levitt play a wisecracking bike messenger? Oh, what's that movie called? It's, it's like the opening of Tomb Raider. Um. <laughs> <laughs> the new one. new one. Oh, what's it called? He did that like after Inception, right? I think it was, I think it was after Inception, yeah. It was like 2011, 2012. Michael Shannon's the villain. Bike man. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember what it's called. Premium Rush. That's right. Premium Rush. <laughs> Bike, Bike Man. Man would have been a better title name. Just it saying. does. Yeah, it is better. At title. least you know what you're getting in for. Yeah. Premium Rush could be anything. Yeah. That movie was all right. Well, I think Premium Rush is like, yeah, it's the, like the, the package yeah, yeah. delivery. Just, just, just so it's, it fit the, just it fit the movie. Just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, Premium Rush is the service that you pay for overnight delivery on your Just premium it's, package. It's relevant. It's a relevant bike, title. Bike it's highly relevant to the story. In a very niche world. Although Bike Man is also relevant. <laughs> <laughs> Where, like someone should make a superhero Bike Man with like bikes for hand, like wheels for arms. Wheels. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's like Edward Scissorhands, but with bike, yeah, bike yeah. wheels. Imagine the crime you could stop. <laughs> <laughs> Crime's twice, gonna pay. Twice the crime that a bicycle cop can so stop. So much faster. <laughs> Him at a mall. It's, it's, the, it's the next Robocop. You stand no chance at a mall against Bike Man. Bike Man Cop. Origins. Origins. <laughs> Starting got... off his Scooter Man. <laughs> <laughs> two wheels to two bigger ones. <laughs> All right, I got some to scratch for us this week. Who we got? Stetson Cole wrote, obviously, a- a- obviously Avatar is owned by Disney. I gave it six more months before you guys are owned by Disney. <laughs> I subscribed. I mean, if they put some extra zeros on that yeah. check, bro. I told them I want that. I'll take that Disney money without hesitation. I don't think they'd give it to us, yeah, though. Yeah. And Preston wrote, no mention of E.T., the video game, single-handedly bankrupting Avatar in our E.T. episode. Unsubscribe. Atari, I'm sorry. Atari. I was going to say. <laughs> so Atari made uh, an E.T. video game. They made like three million copies, and it was horribly designed. They rushed it in like five weeks. The ET game, jeez. And so when people started playing it, it wouldn't work. And so they people started sending the move, sending the game back to stores and getting reimbursed. And also the word of mouth just de- killed killed the sales, and it made Atari go bankrupt. The loss. Damn. So ET killed Atari. <laughs> it's pretty. It's a pretty crazy story. <laughs> All right, that's it for unsubscribes. All right, uh, do we have a Godfather patron shout-out? We don't. We're caught up on our oh, Godfathers. Oh, we're caught up on our Godfathers? Yeah, we're oh, caught no up. no way. Up wow. to speed. I guess someone should start probably sign up for that. So you- <laughs> <laughs> That's, <funny. laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Come on, guys. Like, what's up? Man, yeah, we're, we're, we're out. <laughs> on the- Although we still have a lot more to film. <laughs> <laughs> on this day in film history today. <laughs> Sorry. That was, that was funny. Uh, what are you guys waiting for? Just kidding. We love it. You don't have to be a patron. Uh, on this day in film history, today is September 8th. In, 19, in 1894, William K. L. Dickens Dixon, employed by Thomas Edison, films the first boxing match at West Orange, New Jersey, an exhibition between heavyweight champion James J. Corbett and Peter Courtney. In 1960, Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho was released nationwide in the U.S. In 1966, Star Trek premiered on TV. In 1999, Academy Award-winning Best Picture American Beauty premiered. And happy birthday to Martin Freeman and Gaden Matarazzo. Oh, is that the kid Gat- Gatton from Oh, Gatton. I'm sorry, Gatton. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Dustin. Yeah. Matarazzo. Just... Didn't know he was Italian. Matarazzo. Uh, my streamer recommendation for this episode is The Goonies. It just got added to Hulu this month. I recommend The Rehearsal on HBO Max. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got Anthony to watch it. Yeah, I watched it per your recommendation, and it is one of the craziest sh- things I've ever seen. If you like Nathan for you, uh, yeah. Nathan Fielder's old TV show from Comedy Central, you will love this. It's unlike anything I've ever seen in my entire life. It's yeah. bizarrely unique and very meta. It's the most meta thing I've ever seen. Insane. It's yeah. Nathan is yeah. a genius. Nathan Fielder is such a funny, underrated comedian. Yeah, it's 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 unbelievable. I'm I'm, I'm I was flabbergasted by episode four. I was like, oh my god, I was like, Bro, you, you gotta watch this. <laughs> oh man, I'm gonna. Nathan for you is hilarious. Yeah, I love Nathan for you. Let's get back into our episode on Anton Chigurh. Now, a lot of people out there that I've seen in, you know, like Anthony said, tell me about them. videos. They they say and believe that Anton Chigurh represents a sort of death or the like grim, grim reaper, reaper. The Grim Reaper, death itself. You know, there's probably a lot of evidence for. For that, as you know, he's, he's a killing machine. He kills people. He uses fate as a sort of tool for his killing. However, I disagree with that because death is constantly coming for Anton Chigurh. He's just really hard to kill. <laughs> death comes for him multiple times in the film. Obviously, you could say the 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 shot from Llewellyn Moss that was an attempt at death coming to get him. The car accident. Is clearly death coming to ke- get Anton Sugar. He's driving through a green light, slowly driving the speed limit, completely fitting in, blending into society, following the rules of the road, goes through a green light in the neighborhood, gets T-boned by a car that ran a red light. That, in my opinion, is death coming for Anton Sugar. He's just so hard to kill. So I don't think he technically represents the Grim Reaper or death itself. I absolutely agree. I think it's a mistake to think that Anton represents fate. And the whole, fate and chance are the, the two main themes in this film. And, uh, and I think that it represents that death is coming for us all. And that's why he encounters death himself so many times. If he was a, a symbol of death, then he would just be carrying out death and not trying to survive. Like He's struggling to survive at times in this movie. And if it, if it, was, if it wasn't for him being so 
unlike anyone else, he would die a couple of times. And the car accident is an example of chance and fate. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's driving, like you said, moderate speed through a green light, doing what the rules of the road are, and he gets hit by a car running a red light. It was a chance for him to be driving right at that moment across that intersection, and it was complete chance and fate for this person to be running a red light at that certain time. It's, I think it, it's not the Grim Reaper. It's not death. Chance and fate are the two main themes of this film. The, ac- the car accident it, it is an example. I, I, people might look at this film and be like, what's the point of even having the car accident at the end? It's not really has anything to do with the actual plot. It has everything to do with the movie and everything to do with the, the themes that the movie is carrying, is, are, is explaining and, and showing through these sequences. That is just as important as the coin toss sequence of those two men encountering each other at that random point in time. That's the one of the main threads of the entire film from start to finish, Chance and Fate, and that car accident is an example of it. You could argue that for death coming to get him, that car accident might be the more severe injury with that broken bone sticking out of his arm. You know, you got a bone sticking out your arm. Oh God, look at that goddamn bone. People think, you know, he's got a broken bone that should be easy to fix. If he's doing it himself, it's probably going to be very difficult, and he could probably have a high risk of dying from this broken bone. He obviously has a high pain tolerance, so if he's going to fix it himself... Hopefully he's able to do it, but he's got, hope so. he's got to stick that. <laughs> I, don't know, I want Anton. I want Anton Sugar to survive. I hope man. he doesn't die. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna have to stick that, shove that bone back in his arm and place it and ca- build the cast, or he could turn himself in to prevent dying, or he could, you know, force a doctor to fix it to him. That's probably the most likely scenario. I think he's gonna find a doctor or a vet or somebody to fix his arm for him and then kill that person afterwards. Uh, but what's or he could, or he yeah. could succumb to his injuries and die, which he probably won't do. What's what's scary is I think he's absolutely going to survive making it out of that. Is that we the audience? I feel like knows he'll get out of that no problem. I feel like the audience from everything we've seen in the movie knows that we know that Anton Chigurh is going to find a way to heal himself, fix himself up, and get right back to work probably the next day. So that's what's scary about the character, and it's all established from the film that you know all these bumps and bruises and these crazy obstacles that he put gets put into. He has no pro- no problem overcoming, and he always manages to succeed. So, I think that Anton is an is quite quite a great met- metaphor for fatalism and just fate in general because it's always coming, it never stops. And since he's a representation of it, nothing can stop fate. Nothing can stop Anton Chigurh. No matter how many times you shoot him, no matter uh, how bad his injuries are, no matter how many times you try to prevent fate. Or to try to control fate, there's no way you can ever stop it from happening. So I think that's why he, we know he's going to get out of that, no problem. I think the Coen brothers perfectly show that with after he gets the shirt from the boys. This is clearly the most vulnerable he's ever been. He gives them payment because, you know, this is like part of his principles. And he asked them to like say that I was already gone. And he's walking away. Clearly, besides the broken arm, he has a leg injury as well. He's limping. But once he gets a few steps down that sidewalk, he starts walking normally. Mm -hmm. He's just back to being Anton Chigurh because he is literally the embodiment of the Terminator if the Terminator was a human. Obviously, the Terminator is a killing machine just like Anton Chigurh. There are actually a lot of similarities between the two characters. Let's hear them. They're both the perfect tools. Anton Chigurh calls himself the perfect tool when you watch the film. He is the perfect tool, just like the Terminator is the perfect tool. They're both great at tracking. They're experts at healing as well, healing themselves. Terminator heals his fleshy parts as well, does some reconstructive surgery on his arm. Their weapons are, they're both experts at multiple kinds of weapons as well. They have no feelings or emotions, and they'll never stop coming after their target. That's what Carson Wells tells Llewellyn Moss. He says, he's never going to stop. He'll always keep coming for you, just like the Terminator always keeps coming for their target. So they're actually really similar. It's basically, Anton Chigurh is a Terminator, kind of, if it was a human. And what's interesting about Carson is he knows what Anton is like. He knows that Anton will kill someone if, as long as he sets his mind to it, no matter what. And still yet, even knowing that, Carson still begs for his life, still tries to bargain with him. Still tries to take him to an ATM with fourteen grand in it. Wow, fourteen an ATM. An ATM. So even so, even though Carson understands in some capacity how Anton operates and pursues his subjects, even see, even he 
on the brink of death is trying to buy his way out of it. So it's like even to the even to someone who understands Anton, he still doesn't he still doesn't understand that he can't bargain with him. Like it's it's an amazing scene because Carson knows him probably better than anyone else. There's probably only a handful of people who know Anton Sugar. You've seen his face and you're alive. Yeah. And but that <laughs> compared to what the bubonic plague. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. But then seeing his face and you've seen his face and you're still alive. I think that he's referring to Anton just trying to kill you and you survived is what he's saying because. Obviously, Anton works with people, and that whole op- that business operation, there seems to be hierarchy. So th- he obviously has a boss. So there are people Anton interacts with regularly who know him. Carson being one of them, interacting with each other, uh, probably being around the same circles of criminals. And Anton, like we brought up a few times, is an expert tracker. He can find anyone anywhere. He knows exactly what to look for and where to look. For example, when he gets to the drug deal that had gone bad, the first thing he does is asks for the Scroogey to get the serial number plates off of Llewellyn's truck so that he can identify the vehicle and see who it belongs to, where the other people didn't even think to do that. It's the first thing he does. He also uses Llewellyn Moss's phone bills to trace his mother-in-law, asks for a map of the rooms. And the phone bills are basically how he's able to track Llewellyn Moss or track the money in Llewellyn to Del Rio because a lot of people watch this movie. How did he know to go to Del Rio when he's using the transponder on the highways, just driving around aimlessly looking for a signal? He didn't just get lucky. He makes an educated guess because he's highly intelligent based on the phone bill records. We learn several pieces of information from the phone bill. Shiger calls the one Odessa number that shows up many times on the bill. We learn that the confused voice of his mother-in-law, that Moss is not there. Why, why would Luella be here? <laughs> <laughs> so he heads to Del Rio. Moss lives in Sanderson, Texas. The majority of the calls are to Odessa, Texas and Del Rio. Odessa and Del Rio are the closest to Sanderson, Texas, geographically. Now, Odessa is north, so he's not going to Odessa because otherwise, because he found out from his mother-in-law on the phone that Llewellyn's not there, even though he didn't know his mother-in-law yet. But while Del Rio, Dallas, and Austin are all east of Sanderson, so geographically, Del Rio is the next closest place that Llewellyn Moss would most likely go to to try to hide out to start his journey on escaping and just lay low. So that's why... Anton Chigurh goes to Del Rio. It's an educated best get an educated guess based on being an excellent tracker and knowing people. Yeah, and also like he he's great at getting information. Like when he's talking to the chicken coop guys, like he's asking him where's the airport, and that's a way of him understanding El Paso is the location that he needs to get to. Well, an airport or an airstrip? airstrip. Well, <laughs> where are you going? I don't know, <laughs> brother. I've been there. <laughs> Could you get the chicken coops out of the car? What do you want about? <laughs> it's amazing. I I love how Anton speaks to people, because it and Javier he does his, his body language is so precise in this film. He moves so slowly and so controlled. Like after he kills Carson, and then he as the phone's ringing, he slowly just turns his body and chair and places the the phone on the table next to him and then when he's ready he answers it and also the eye contact of anton sugar and the body language he has when he's speaking to other people is just incredibly revealing about the character he's a completely dominant personality he never loses he never he rarely looks away from people in the eye he maintains power in every situation uh, with his stance with his posture and this calculating almost robotic way of moving it, it's, he seems so inhuman just from the physical performance that Javier Bardem carried out in this film. But the eye contact is really in- incredible, especially in the gas station sequence. He loves just watching people and using his eyes to basically show I'm in charge of this situation. I have control over you. And you can see like gas station attendant actor Woody Harrelson when they're interacting with him and they're always like looking away and looking down at times because they feel insecure, very nervous and anxious around him. Whereas Javier is just constantly maintaining eye contact with the other actor. His smile too is extremely creepy. He pulls it out a few times, but it's so hard to describe. It's just soulless. But like, I think your description is so great of basically it's like an alien. If they wanted to seem like they were a human, to blend just like in, the yeah. fakest 
soulless smile that he gives to people to make them feel some sort of com- some feeling of comfort in the interactions right before he kills them. And in terms of killing, he's turned killing basically into an art form. <laughs> he's an expert shot with multiple weapons, but he can improvise with anything. The handcuffs in the opening sequence is just really thrilling but terrifying at the same time. You you've never seen anyone get killed like that with suffocating some strangling someone with handcuffs and then popping the the carotid artery in their neck at the same time it's just an art form with this guy in the silencer shotgun all that beautiful the the captive bolt stunner (laughs) i can see why you don't want him to die (laughs) (laughs) now i sound like the serial killer (laughs) fit the description (laughs) early 30s white (laughs) male (laughs) and i think there might be at times a little confusion of why he killed certain people like why does he kill the two criminals in the desert when they're over looking over the drug scene gone wrong I think he there's a couple of options we can we can discern that he could have killed them because they they got the drug they they're the reason why the part of the reason why the drug deal went wrong. Also, you could say maybe the boss instructed Anton to kill them. Uh, I think those because like they seem to be allies working for the same company. So why did he kill them? I think those are like the two main options. Although we don't really know for sure why he killed those two guys. But uh, you could say it could either be part of his job or part of his principle why do, you, why do you think i think his principle is the same reason why he killed his employer because once he found out that other people were hired that's when he got offended by the employer got and killed the employer because he tells him why would you hire anybody else i'm the perfect tool he is the perfect tool he's offended that he would hire anybody else so i think it's just part of his principles yeah i completely agree and the carla jean scene uh, there's obviously debate about whether or not he killed her. Definitely killed her. I think without a doubt he killed her because he checks his the bottom of the soles of his shoes when he leaves the house. So he walks out of the house and then he checks both soles of his shoes. He's clearly looking for any blood left, blood traces on his shoes because there's probably blood on that floor, Carla Jean's blood. So I think obviously we don't see the Coen brothers cut away to it, it's Carla Jean and him are just staring at each other and then, and then he just has like this kind of like smirk on his face and then it cuts to him exiting the house checking the bottom of the shoes of his feet are, is clearly the evidence we have to know that he for sure killed carla jean he definitely killed her yeah and but it's also tragic. what i what i love about that scene is that carla jean is refusing to play his game she's refusing to flip the coin and you you can see the 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 look on his face he's like he's in disbelief he's like you have to call it like i can't call it for you you have to do this and i feel like nobody has ever said no to that before based in in such a profound way based upon his reaction to her so i i like that scene a lot and kelly mcdonald is a terrific actress she's you've seen her in train spotting and scottish scottish actress and she's in deathly hallows part two rowena ravenclaw very good actress and her and javier together made a really terrific kind of like a finale for llewellyn's storyline and I like how he doesn't do the coin toss with Carson Wells. He kills Carson Wells because Carson Wells was tracking to kill him. So it's, he doesn't have to use the coin toss. It's He's being wrong. He's being hunted by Carson Wells, an inferior hitman. And they have a relationship. And But why doesn't um, Anton Chigurh really believe Carson Wells or let Carson Wells bring him the money? Because Carson Wells tells him, I know where the money is. It's just off the river. I can it can be here at your feet in twenty minutes if you just let me go and get it. And Anton's amused by this entire situation. And even I think if he believes Carson Wells knowing where the money is and that the money could be there, I think he's more interested in Llewellyn bringing the money to his feet. He's more interested in having the person who's been messing with him so much and just on the run from him he wants Llewellyn to be the one to bring him the money I think that's why he doesn't let Carson do it yeah I think obviously he doesn't believe Carson at first because Carson because he says if you had the money if you knew where the money is you'd have it with you so that at first Anton doesn't believe him but then when when uh, Carson says I, I, found, I found it by the river then like you said then Anton says well I know something better I know it's it's going to be brought to me so I agree with you. I think that even though I think that Anton believes Carson at the af, at the second half of the conversation when he reveals where it is, but he, Anton's uninterested in getting the money right now. What he wants is to get Llewellyn. So I'm in complete agreement for even though he believed Carson and that Carson knows where the money is, that's not what he's interested in. He's interested in 
Llewellyn bringing the money to him. That's what he wants. If the rule you followed brought you to this, what use was the rule? Of what use was the rule? Great line. Yeah. I believe it's a different point in the book he says that, but it you know, it fits pretty well in that scene right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a great scene. I love the death of Carson Wells off camera. We just see Anton shoot the shotgun while the phone starts ringing after like the second or third ring, and then he just places his feet above the blood to not get his feet in the in the pile of blood, in the pool of blood, uh, to get evidence on his shoes. And it's one shot. It's all one shot where Anton kills Carson, phone's ringing, and then he changes his position and picks up the phone. It's like a 40-second shot that doesn't cut, and it's really terrific. It's just a, a slight... Uh, Deacons just slightly pans it to match... Javier's movement in the seat and then that's it and we don't see Carson we never see Carson again we don't even see him get shot that's what I love off-screen violence like that is just like so perfect I'm sure maybe they shot that side of it but it, it works so well not cutting there's also another character in the film who almost gets killed by Anton Chigurh but is saved yes. by a sound so the woman at the trailer park when Anton Chigurh comes in asking about- We can't about, give out that information! When he comes into the trailer park to start asking questions about where Llewellyn Moss is, where he works, she can't give out that information. You can tell that he's about to kill her until he hears a noise in the back of the office and leaves eventually after that. Because if she was alone, you can assume he would have either just killed her just then or done the coin toss with her. Yeah, I think that because obviously he could kill both of them easily- but I suppose the reason why he didn't kill them both is he doesn't take take risks and an unforeseen variable in the situation that he didn't in plan for is probably why he he probably has a code where if I don't know about something, I'm out of there. That might be why he left and didn't because he could have killed them both. It's probably just some other guy that works there. But he didn't know who that was. Maybe he's like he never takes a chance. Yeah, you don't know who's back there. Yeah, an unknown back. variable. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. he just leaves. But he does break into Llewellyn's trailer before that and sits at his sofa after looking at the phone bills with a half a gallon glass, I mean, bottle of milk. <laughs> so glass what, milk. What's, yeah, yeah. what's he holding the milk for and what, what's he doing? He doesn't even take a sip of it. He just sits down. He looks at it, and then he looks at his reflection in the TV screen. It's a great shot that Deacon's got of his reflection holding the milk. And... Milk obviously is used in a lot of movies and film. It's uh, looked at as a symbol of innocence, childhood, adolescence, and maybe his looking at it is a form of just disgust at innocence, or maybe just that's why he doesn't take a sip of it. I, I think it's a really interesting moment. Oh, but also um, there there are famous moments of killers drinking milk. So you have Christoph Waltz as Hans Landa drinking milk in the opening scene of Inglorious Bastards. And you have Alex in A Clockwork Orange and his gang drinking the milk in A clock in Clockwork Orange. So I think that maybe it could be like a, a symbolic hearkening to those films, to those great maybe, yeah. psychopathic characters as well, sociopathic I think so characters. Too. But for different reasons. Obviously, I think in in um, Clockwork Orange, I think that the milk represents that these are just kids committing all these horrific crimes. Mm. You know, they're still children, basically. They're, they're yeah. not even adults And that, yet. that milk is, it, it gets you buzzed. It, it, True. It's a drug. But I think that's a symbol of the milk is to show that just children are carrying out these horrific acts and crimes. And yeah. then, uh, obviously, with Hans Landa, it's kind of similar. He's drinking the innocence of these of this family. Love it. <laughs> so it's great metaphors. And so I, I think Anton's is somewhere around there. It's, it's up for interpretation for sure because it's interesting that he doesn't take a sip of it. He just looks at it and is just holding it in his hand. Looking for a man who has recently drunk milk. Oh, oh Jeff, we got to get this out. We got we to gotta tell somebody. But he does he does drink it because when Ed Tom and the deputy show up, that, that glass has much less milk in it. So uh, Anton definitely drank oh, from. That's a good point. Yeah, we don't see it on camera though. Yeah, yeah we don't see him actually like drink it and get like a milk mustache or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I love how that people thought that was real. Like the, the campaigns for milk, it's genius. But I've never gotten a milk mustache. I don't think I've gotten chocolate milk mustaches. I feel like. But I, I guess got, if you have a mustache, I, you're yeah, more, if you have a mustache, you're, you're more likely to get, get milk on it. But I mean, like kids, you take a sip of milk and you're like hoping to get that white mustache. You have to make it happen. Yeah, the commercials, it which, just fades away. It's clearly like paint on their lips on the commercials or something but it's like it's like whipped cream or something i wish it did that that'd be really cool what's interesting is uh javier kind of started this i guess tradition of oscar winners playing bond villains so after he won this oscar then he played uh the villain silva in skyfall 
And then Christoph Waltz wins his Oscar, plays Blofeld in Spectre, and then Rami Malek wins an Oscar, and he plays the villain in No Time to Die. So maybe if you want to figure out who the next Bond villain is, who's recently won an Oscar? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good point. It's like an un, it's a tradition that started with Javier Bardem. And there's a great uh, gag, Jean Dujardin, who won an Oscar for The Artist. He did a great, he hosted SNL, and there was a great skit that they did where after winning an Oscar, one of the things you do is you play a Bond villain. And it has him like auditioning for a Bond villain role, reading a scene as, a, as one of the villains. I, th I think it's a really cool tradition that has started recently with the last three Bond films. You got anything else on Anton Chigurh? I think I'm pretty solid about all of his scenes. Yeah, I mean, Anton Chigurh, just one of the most fascinating antagonists and villains in fiction of the 21st century and film in the 21st century for sure. Oh, what year did... The book come out. I think it was actually two thousand. Yeah, but I do. I do want to say twenty first century. I think there might be a misconception about the coin toss being used for justice. I don't think justice has any part to play in Anton's uh, actions. Justice, you, yeah, yeah, that's... or motivations. I think it's all just fate and chance. It's murdering people. Yeah, jeez. Louise. But yeah, I saw. I saw a lot online articles and some YouTube videos talking about. You know, he's a representation of justice. I think. What the gas station do yeah because he guy, deserved dude. to die what are you talking term, about yeah so I, I in terms of anton's version of justice goodness gracious from that perspective but, oh, it, but i mean it's it not that it's it's fate and chance yeah. is what it is anyways yeah. anton sugar had to clear that up is one of the most fascinating villains what's your favorite line unknowable evil um my favorite line of anton sugars what's the most you've ever lost on a coin toss what's the most you ever lost in a coin toss my favorite line is I got here the same way the coin did. Yeah. I think it's it's in, in Carla Jean's, and that's when it cuts away. And it's a perfect example of his philosophy. All right, that wraps our episode on Anton Chigurh, our analyzing evil of this character. Thanks so much for tuning in. Be sure to become a patron today at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Take care, y'all. This episode of Raiders of the Lost Podcast has been executive produced through Patreon by our amazing Chosen One patrons, Calvin Cam, Lauren Smertz, Cody Moen, John Agras, Tyler McFly, Anthony DeMeo, and Becca Keen. Thank you so much for contributing to our show. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button as well, notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.